Okay, so let's get started. And uh, the first part, we are going to uh, look a little bit into uh, the last part of the wavelets. And then we're going to move over to the nonlinear systems. One of the things uh, why wavelets are so uh, useful is the following. Suppose that you do a uh, frequency analysis. And let's say that uh, you have an... Uh, you have an epoch of uh, 10 seconds. And let's say that we have a sample rate, which, would, which I will abbreviate to uh, SR, of uh, 1,000 uh, samples per second, or which I will call 1,000 hertz now. <coughs> and let us assume that we have, which is a little bit violating the uh, um, the idea of a Fourier transform of stationarity. Let's say that we have a burst of uh, a wave here and there. And that uh, wave is uh, 30.01 hertz. Now if I do an, uh, a Fourier transform of this uh, whole thing, I will get a uh, power spectrum that has a resolution of 1 over 10, so 1 tenth of a hertz. And I'm going to kind of have the power spectrum up to the Nyquist frequency, so up to 500 hertz. OK, so that's kind of what, uh, what would happen if I, if I made this analysis uh, in this way. Now let's say that in contrast, I'm now going to uh, capture two seconds. And I'm capturing again this uh, frequency. And now if I do uh, the frequency analysis and I get my power spectrum, my spectral resolution is 1 over 2, so it's 1 half hertz. And again, it will be up to 500 hertz, isn't it? It's the Nyquist frequency uh, remains the same. So now the point that I want to make here. <coughs> the point that I want to make here is that if you do standard uh, Fourier analysis um, and violating the idea of stationarity here, then my uncertainty about where this uh, burst is is basically 10 seconds, isn't it? I really don't know where this uh, is uh, going to be. The way I drew it is easy to see. Oh, yeah, it's there, it's there. But usually it's embedded in noise, and it's not that obvious <laughs> where that is. So my uncertainty is 10 seconds. Uh, on the other hand, here I know that uh, because of the resolution of my spectrum, it is somewhere between 30 and 30.1 hertz. So my uncertainty here is basically 0.1 hertz. It's somewhere in between here is where I see the peak in my power spectrum. And in reality, since I have only a resolution of one third, I don't know exactly where it is. But I know it's in between these two. Now here in this case, where I have two seconds, I. Um, I say, well, I'm doing a little bit better here, isn't it? Because uh, my uncertainty is not 10 seconds, but my uncertainty is just 2 seconds. I know at least it is within this epoch. Still don't know exactly where it is, but my uncertainty is a little bit less. But uh, if you now look at the spectral domain, you can see that now it is some, somewhere between 30 and 30.5 hertz, isn't it? Because that's my spectral resolution, a half hertz. And this actually uh, is a pretty deep uh, observation because it goes back to the Heisenberg uh, principle of uncertainty. We really don't know where things are. And you can see there is some kind of a uh, preservation of uncertainty because if I'm really very uncertain here, I'm a little more certain here. If I'm a little more certain there, in contrast, I am more uncertain here. 
And so uh, there is uh, certainty in the time domain, basically translates in a little bit more uncertainty in the frequency domain, and vice versa. It actually is an, uh, a figure in the, in the book, figure 16.3, that uh, reflects that. I'm going to hold that up. That's the, the kind of Heisenberg boxes here. You can see that in one case there is uncertainty in this area, but less in that area. And in the other case there is uh, less certainty in the time domain, but more uncertainty in the frequency domain, which is basically the example I just uh, showed you. And this is actually the cool thing of uh, wavelet uh, uh, analysis, because with wavelet analysis you basically don't know uh, what your signal is, where the non-stationarities are. So what you do is you just do everything. You, uh, you kind of cross all the scales. So instead of doing this or that, you're doing basically everything. And in that case, you, uh, you, can, you can deal with, uh, with this uncertainty a little bit better. We are going to do one example. So if you start a MATLAB and run program 16 underscore 1, so the first uh, program of chapter 16. And if you run that program, you will get three uh, figures. Let's first look at figure one, and then you look at the other ones. Figure one here is um, the wavelet that we are using. And the wavelet that we are using here is this one. It's uh, called the Mexican hat for obvious reasons, I think. Uh, it looks like a cross-section of a Mexican hat. It's actually the second derivative of a uh, Gaussian. And the second uh, panel here shows you the signal that we are going to analyze. And this is more or less to mimic that situation that we uh, just uh, had on the blackboard. We have a low frequency. We have, on the other end, a high frequency. And here we have a mixture of the two in the middle. And now what we do is uh, we use the uh, wavelet analysis as we discussed that in the last lecture. Uh, we're going to do this in two ways. We're going to use convolution and cross-correlation. And since the Mexican hat is a uh, uh, symmetric, it has uh, even symmetry, uh, it basically gives you the same result. And uh, <coughs> so I'm going to just show you one figure two, and you have to maximize the figure in order to see uh, uh, the full effect. And here you see what I was just saying, that what is the nice thing of the wavelet, uh, the wavelet approach is that, well, at this scale, I can see the low frequencies quite well. See? This is where they are, at the beginning and in the middle. But at this scale, the high frequencies don't show up that well, but here they do, see, at this scale. So I can, with this wavelet analysis, I can basically see in the frequency range here where the frequencies are basically occ uh, occurring in, in, in the frequency domain. And in the time domain, which is the horizontal line, I can also say pretty precisely where they are happening, here and there. And so that's the, 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 the really nice aspect of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the wavelet uh, transform. If you did something similar in, uh, in the Fourier domain, you would have an, uh, a spectrogram. If you do this in the, uh, the wavelet domain, it's called a uh, scalogram. And as a matter of fact, uh, the, the, front, uh, the front page of the book is a uh, scalogram and a spectrogram. The top is the spectrogram, and here is the scalogram of an epileptic seizure. And you can see basically here that things are happening at the frequency domain. But here you can see it with uh, much higher precision. Now the last example that I uh, wanted to show, we're going to stay in MATLAB, uh, is that there is in MATLAB an um, a uh, wave menu that you can use to uh, use wavelet analysis. And it's actually pretty nice. Uh, you can use the menu or you can also use the subroutines, uh, yes? Oh, just uh, wondering, so why do, you, why do you see those like, default characters in the scale graph? 
Say it again. Why do we see like uh, a ripple sort of character? Yeah, why do we see that? Yeah, basically you see this ripple effect because you correlate your wavelet with the signal. And so since the signal is going up and down and your wavelet too, that means that your uh, correlation is also going to go up and down or your convolution in this case. That's the reason. And that's the same thing you see that here. The only difference is, is here it happens much faster than there, which is reasonable because this is a higher frequency than this one. But you still can, uh, yeah, you still can really see it. The only thing you cannot see, and that's the advantage, of course, if you do a Fourier transform, is that you see what the hertz is. You kind of know exactly, oh, yeah, this is uh, somewhere in between 30 and 30.1. Uh, Here you uh, have to uh, do an, a real effort to translate this into hertz. And so for that reason, most of the time people just give you the scalogram. And sometimes they will give you the translation to hertz, but sometimes they won't. Yep. To uh, start up that uh, uh, program, you just type uh, wave menu. I'm going to close everything first. So you type wave menu, one word, and that will give you this uh, user interface. gives you a lot of uh, options. We are just going to look at uh, a simple one and two dimensional wavelet transform. But you can also see there is a wavelet packet transform there and there is much more stuff that you can do. Uh, so if you have a signal that you have recorded in your research, you can always go to this wavelet menu and, uh, and do a quick, uh, a quick analysis. Uh, let's do a wavelet 1D. So I click on wavelet 1D. And then I get another window. And that window has a file menu, so I do a load of a signal. I'm going to load a signal to do uh, some analysis. And the signal that I'm going to do is an uh, alpha rhythm. It's a human alpha rhythm. It looks like this. So it's roughly a 10 hertz. Uh, 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 oscillation. And now let's do a uh, Haar wavelet transform, so we can leave the Haar where it is. Let's do three levels, that's enough I think, instead of uh, five. And then you say you click analyze. And then this is the result you're getting. So now this is the wavelet transform as we uh, discussed it. This is basically the average or the trend. And this is the first, and the second, and the third difference. This is the third, the second, and the, and the first. And you can see that uh, basically in the average you have uh, captured quite a bit of your, uh, your signal. But uh, it's definitely not everything because your differences uh, are also uh, significant. What would be your prediction if we changed the Haar wavelet, in this case, to the Daubecky's one, which was the other one we looked at? Would we be better or worse in uh, capturing this signal in the trend? Better. better, yeah. Because the Daubecky's wavelet is a little more a continuous signal eh, and, as opposed to the Haar wavelet. So let's do that. Let's kind of click on the wavelet. And dB is Daubecky's. And the one that we used was the number four. So you click Daubecky's number four and the third level. And, and we hit analyze again. And you see, you're absolutely right. You're capturing much better uh, the, the, shape of your, uh, the shape of your signal in your average as opposed to, uh, and this is already uh, a third level, so this is pretty good. So if you, uh, yeah, you want to have a quick look at your, uh, uh, your signal's decomposition using different wavelets, uh, now you understand what it's doing. You can, you can see that this is a pretty powerful uh, tool. We can also do this in two dimensions. So if you are into uh, microscopy, let's close this one. We can do a 2D wavelet transform. And again, we do file, and now we load an image. 
to the image. And the image we are loading is Lena underscore double. And uh, you can just say yes to the question. We could go black and white, but. Um, so Lena is an image that's being used quite a bit for uh, image processing. Uh, Lena is in a pinup, and uh, the only significant thing she's wearing is that hat, so that's the reason the picture is cut off in uh, most textbooks. And you can see that most of the signal processors are probably male uh, that have been uh, working with this. Um, so in this case, Lena has uh, a number of uh, uh, a number of uh, things that you could enhance, and for instance, you have a lot of uh, lines here that are different. You have contrast. You have uh, so that's the reason that uh, this image uh, comes back in image processing books uh, again and again and again. It's kind of a standard uh, uh, standard to uh, work with that. So let's do a higher second uh, uh, level transform. And so now, remember what we discussed last time, is that you now basically do the transform both in the horizontal and in the vertical uh, line. And I'm going to say uh, number four of the full size, because that uh, makes it a little bit easier to discuss. So see here you see the first level of the Haar wavelet transform. Here, this is the second level of the Haar wavelet transform. And you can clearly see that in this case, the horizontal lines and the oblique lines are enhanced. And here it is the oblique lines and the vertical lines that are enhanced. I look at the lip and the shoulder here, and then the, the vertical part here of the arm and the hair, etc. here. And this part is the, uh, is the, uh, uh, the fluctuations. So here we have only the diagonal uh, lines that are being uh, enhanced. And of course, if you start superimposing these images again with the original image, you can do something like edge enhancing. Right? You can really imagine that you can uh, use this. And you could use an, a standard filtering technique, as we, uh, as we discussed when you do digital filtering. But uh, the wavelet transform is actually uh, doing, uh, doing quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you wanted to detect uh, uh, edges, you wanted to use a high-pass filter. If you, on the other hand, if you wanted to detect uh, constants, you would use a low-pass filter. Yeah, absolutely. So that concludes the part on um, on wavelets, and uh, with the wavelets, we have abandoned. Uh, the idea that all our signals are uh, stationary. Right now, we are also going to abandon the idea that all our signals are linear. And uh, most of the stuff that uh, we are going to discuss on nonlinear systems, today we are going to discuss a little bit that is described in chapter 17 of the first book. But uh, the rest of the stuff uh, is going to be in, uh, and I'm going to use lowercase here to distinguish the two books, is going to be in chapters 2, 3, and 4. I probably will not have enough time to get to the higher chapters in that uh, book. And that's going to be in the, uh, in the other book, uh, the, the one on uh, the companion volume. And that's about uh, nonlinear processes. Also, if I give you homework, uh, I'm going to say uh, uh, homework of lowercase chapter two. You have to go back, you have to go through in your uh, exercises because that's kind of after all the homework assignments uh, in, uh, for the first book. So, nonlinear systems. What are nonlinear systems? You actually already know that. Eh? Any uh, system that violates uh, superposition and scaling is uh, is nonlinear. And uh, if you uh, if you, for instance, uh, and we we discussed that also for linear systems, uh, you can have uh, static and dynamic uh, systems. Then. Uh, 
The static systems are instantaneous. They basically have output that's uh, related to current input. Uh, whereas dynamic systems basically have a memory, uh, and we're talking causal systems here, so in that case the present and the past is going to determine uh, the uh, output. These systems are relatively simple still. The dynamic systems uh, uh, will require a little more uh, intense uh, math. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you to... Uh, read the part on uh, static systems for yourself. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that you can use to uh, uh, characterize uh, static systems are Taylor series or McLaurin series. And they basically give you, uh, give you an idea how input and output are related in a uh, static system. Uh, and I'm actually going to uh, uh, give you your homework now because after this I'm going to go to uh, show you a little bit about nonlinear systems to a PowerPoint uh, presentation. So uh, after that we probably won't have uh, uh, the lights on. We'll just kind of end after the PowerPoint presentation. So your homework for that reason is that you are going to read uh, uh, chapter 2 up to section 2.5 because that's where we will continue uh, the next uh, lecture and you're going to do uh, exercise uh, 2.1 and again this is 2.1 from the second uh, book chapter uh, it's a nice uh, piece of homework because it lets you uh, uh, basically uh, use these uh, series to show that the Euler uh, expression is correct. And we have been using the Euler expression quite a bit, so now actually in the homework you get to uh, prove, uh, prove this one. So I'm going to talk about these nonlinear systems uh, uh, actually in the context of uh, some of uh, the research uh, that has been going on in, uh, in epilepsy, um, uh, especially uh, predicting of uh, occurrence of seizures, uh, which of course is a big deal in epilepsy because if you, if you are kind of, uh, uh, you don't know when you're going to get a seizure, that, uh, that's kind of uh, fairly uh, uh, inconvenient in your daily life. And in research actually, you also would like to know when seizures are imminent because you could basically look very early and see maybe some of and understand a little bit better of the uh, ongoing processes. Um, Usually the seizures are recorded, that's still the gold standard, using the electroencephalogram, or EEG. We discussed that in one of the first lectures, and this is actually a diagram of the standard uh, uh, recording systems for EEG, the 1020 system. That allows people to internationally uh, communicate with each other. There are roughly uh, between 40 and 50 types of uh, clinical seizures. There are I mean the, the, the most well-known types uh, and, uh, and, and uh, large group of seizures are generalized. It means that uh, uh, the, brain, uh, the brain basically starts a seizure at uh, multiple locations almost at the same time. It's uh, generalized. And the most well-known one is the tonic-clonic one where uh, there is a uh, tonic and a uh, clonic phase uh, that uh, alternate. Uh, the other type... Uh, uh, is the, uh, oh, by the way, this is uh, how a seizure like that looks. You have multiple channels. This is an EEG uh, just recorded on the scalp. You see the EEG ongoing, and at this point in time, all the leads basically start to uh, oscillate uh, violently, and that's when the, the clinical seizure also, uh, also starts. The other seizure type, uh, big, big group of seizure types, is not involving uh, the, the whole brain, but just one part of the brain, one half of the brain uh, by definition. Uh, and here is an example of one that starts in the hippocampus, um, and then from there it, uh, it spreads to other areas in the brain. These are called partial seizures. Um, they can have secondary generalizations, but uh, in this particular example it shows one that uh, does not. And there are basically two types, uh, two, two groups again, the complex partial seizure where consciousness is lost and the, 
uh, the simple one, the simple partial seizure, where the patient uh, does not uh, lose consciousness. In these cases, uh, um, when you have uh, a group of patients, uh, which is pretty consistent actually, if you think about uh, this, uh, epilepsy uh, uh, has a prevalence of about 1 to 2 percent of the whole population, and about one third of these uh, patients uh, does not respond uh, to medication. So that's a big group, and that group basically has not been uh, smaller, uh, not grown smaller over the last four or five decades. So in spite of the fact that we have more medication uh, than 50 years ago, the ratio of people that doesn't respond to medication of one third has remained the same. And we are talking worldwide roughly about 22 million people. So that's, uh, that's the size of the population of the Midwest of the United States, so it's not a small problem. In these uh, cases, uh, sometimes uh, removal of the brain part uh, causes these uh, uh, intractable seizures, the seizures uh, of patients that do not respond, uh, uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be helped by uh, removing uh, the, uh, the, the part where the seizures uh, originate. And this is part of the stuff that's going here uh, on here in the pediatrics department that uh, uh, these patients are then monitored for, uh, for about a week and then uh, in that uh, time uh, it is determined where exactly on cortex you see there is an, uh, an array of electrodes uh, or a matrix of electrodes uh, put over the cortex. Here you see that in a uh, CT scan um, and that allows us to uh, uh, determine with uh, about, about a millimeter precision, millimeter to centimeter precision where these seizures uh, do occur. And that, again, is then an indication for the surgeon where uh, pieces can be removed. Of course, under the condition that these pieces can be removed safely, that it's not part of the cortex that uh, has an important uh, function, such as language. Or this, of course, uh, generates an, a wealth of, uh, uh, of information uh, that we also can use for further research. And I'll show you a couple of these partial seizures as we record with these uh, intracranial electrodes. Uh, here you see a uh, seizure, and you probably would have a hard time telling me where the seizure is. And uh, I actually know where it is, of course. Uh, uh, it, you can see it actually occurring on this uh, channel here. Uh, and so you would think that this is a minor, uh, a minor event if you looked at it uh, at the electrical signal. As a matter of fact, the patient uh, uh, was not at all an, uh, a non-serious case. It was a very serious case. So you cannot always see by the electrical activity uh, uh, what the clinical implications are. And this is another example where it's really easier to see where the seizure starts. It's somewhere here, and then you can see it spread to other electrodes. It, uh, it remains still uh, contained in, an, uh, in a smaller area, but you can see it really spread. And in this case, of course, uh, uh, it's, it's obvious that the, uh, uh, that the epileptologist will tell the surgeon, well, these areas that, that, uh, that start a seizure are, of course, the first candidates for, uh, for surgical uh, resection. So now let's get back to uh, prediction. So what you would like um, if, you, uh, if you were able to uh, predict when a seizure occurs is that you uh, could say something in this area, here is where the seizure starts. Something is happening here that you would like to detect or recognize and say, well, really now a seizure is imminent and I should warn the patient or I should start using medication or uh, as if you are a researcher, I should really look carefully what's going on in that area. Well, predictability is, uh, is a difficult thing in general. And uh, Niels Bohr, uh, actually he mentioned that, he said, well, it's very difficult to predict, especially the future. And that's absolutely true, because sometimes if you want to play as if you can predict, it seems like you're doing a good job, but then when you really put it to the test, um, it, uh, it always appears to be very difficult. If you had a simple system such as a pendulum, it's doable. If you have a pendulum and that thing has an, uh, I measure the period of that pendulum, I can pretty much predict uh, uh, where that uh, pendulum is going to be 
in a minute, in two minutes, in five minutes, and if there is not too much friction or I can quantify the friction maybe within an hour. Huh? So that's, uh, yeah, you could say it's a deterministic system, isn't it? Uh, the, the, the present and the past g are going to determine the future. And uh, with that pendulum, it's okay. So would that mean that uh, if I have a deterministic system that I can predict the future? Nope. Because uh, we all know that uh, the weather is, uh, is clearly uh, composed of deterministic uh, 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 components. Uh, it's molecules, it's, it's uh, uh, airflow, it's, uh, it's all stuff that you could in principle quantify. But uh, uh, as a matter of fact, you know that uh, predicting the weather is, uh, is, is certainly not always easy. And so the fact that you have a deterministic system does not implicate that uh, you can actually uh, predict what is uh, going to happen. You could say, well, but that's because this is a simple system and this is a complex system and this is just hard to predict because it's so complex. That's not true either. Because if you think about the tides, uh, they are actually pretty easy and pretty well predictable. Uh, the tide uh, tables are uh, predicting uh, months and months ahead uh, what the tides are going to be, and they're pretty good. And if you think about the complexity of predicting the tides, I mean, the exact uh, uh, um, uh, front line of the, the coast, uh, uh, the weather, the, the position of the moon, and there, is, there is lots of stuff going into this uh, into this uh, generator for tides, so it's a complex system. But nonetheless, it's, uh, it's pretty predictable, just as that pendulum was uh, pretty predictable. So complexity and determinism or simplicity is really not, uh, not it. You can see that in these systems, uh, there is a sort of randomness. Uh, and let's go back to an even simpler system than the weather. It's, uh, it's the lotto. If you have uh, 36 or 40 of these little balls bouncing around, you would say that if you are a physicist uh, knowing about uh, uh, collision and elasticity and things like that, you should be able to predict what's going on. And we all know that's not really the case eh, because uh, there is uh, a lot of randomness in this, uh, in this outcome of, uh, of these lotto results. So what's the take home message here? The take home message here is that uh, uh, if you have a deterministic system and if we believe that our brain is uh, a deterministic system, it still does not uh, mean that it will be predictable. It depends really on, uh, on a number of things. And uh, um, in this case, for instance, the weather, we also know that there is a horizon over which predictions are reasonable. And beyond that horizon, let's say nowadays it's about uh, three or four days or maybe a week if you're an optimist. Uh, but beyond the week, it's very difficult to predict what the weather is going to be. So beyond that horizon, it's really, uh, it's really very difficult. And uh, in that sense, uh, these systems can uh, really start to behave as a an, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, system that generates random numbers. That's, so that's important to, uh, to realize. And it's really uh, important to realize that uh, um, very simple systems can have very complex behavior. And in the book, in chapter 17, uh, we have an, uh, uh, we have an, uh, an example uh, where we use uh, the logistic equation. This is the equation. And as you can see, it's nonlinear because there is a uh, quadratic term in there. And if you, uh, if you put a parameter such <coughs> uh, that uh, the behavior is simple, you can get this system to behave as, okay, it's going to go to an equilibrium and stay there forever or it's going to oscillate between two extreme points, which is also like the pendulum, still pretty predictable. But on the other hand, if I start to play with uh, A and I give A uh, numbers that are a little bit higher, then we get behavior that uh, looks regular, but if you start to look very precisely, you see that this is absolutely not regular. There is nothing that repeats here. This looks a little bit like that, but it's not it. And this looks like that, but it really isn't if you are looking at it uh, very precisely. And this is uh, chaos. 
So this is really uh, chaotic behavior that comes from a very, very simple logistic equation. And this value A, you can vary over, uh, uh, over a number of values, and that's uh, basically what you can see in the next uh, figure. It's called the Feigenbaum diagram, because Feigenbaum was the first to come up with this, uh, with this one. And here you can see if the value of A is increasing, the state over which the system is, uh, uh, is, is going to is going to be one state. Or here it's oscillating, it's two states. Here it's uh, four states. And pretty much if you get uh, close to four, you have an infinite number of states. And so here is uh, chaos, and here is a very simple deterministic behavior. And this is the period doubling route to chaos. Eh? So you go from a single state to two states to four states. Eventually, you end up with chaos. If you are here, we can predict. The closer you get to this uh, point, the more difficult it's going to be to predict. So let's get back to our idea that we would be able to predict the occurrence of a seizure. What we had said is we would like uh, to be able to, when the seizure starts here, let me say we start here uh, with uh, the seizure, which is also called the uh, ictal period, then we would like to be able to extract something from this signal that uh, gives us a warning crossing some kind of a threshold before the seizure really starts. So this is kind of our wish list. This is not something we recorded already, but that's what we would like. We would like to extract something from that that says, ah, something is going to happen. And then uh, when it happens, uh, it really uh, is there. And then after it's done, you would expect uh, that uh, uh, parameter to kind of go back. That that's would, would be the ideal if we could find something like that. Well, if you are going to uh, look for something like that that says, well, I'm going to have some pre-ictal warning of the ictal, i.e. seizure uh, uh, event, then the first step you are going to uh, test is uh, looking at linear methods. And uh, that's something uh, that uh, you always should do. You should always start simple and uh, not start difficult. Start simple. See what you can uh, um, get from there. Well, uh, Brian Litt in, uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia did something on, uh, uh, in this case, uh, seizures from adults. And he simply looked at the power. So that's uh, something we discussed. Uh, you can just extract power over a window. And you can see that the power during a seizure is sky high. And his point was that uh, roughly seven hours before the seizure, he can already see uh, bursts of uh, power uh, uh, showing that something is uh, about to happen. To be honest with you, when, when you see this, uh, and, and you would probably have the same thing, I say, well, that's really nice, but if you want to convince me, you have to show me what's happening here. <laughs> uh, or you have to show me uh, some result uh, of an, uh, another day when there was no seizure. Uh, and, uh, and so for that reason, of course, this is still uh, yeah, very much uh, uh, disputable whether this is uh, useful or not. Uh, we did something uh, similar uh, on a uh, children's uh, record. And this is that one record that I showed you where the seizure was difficult to uh, detect in this channel. But uh, the interesting thing was that uh, uh, when we looked at the uh, power, we, uh, we actually uh, uh, yeah, I could find something that behaved a little bit as our wish list, because here is where the seizure is. And you can see that, uh, and this is roughly an hour before the seizure. And this is uh, uh, yeah, roughly uh, half an hour, three quarters of an hour after the seizure. And you can see that uh, yeah, there is a little bit of a trend towards the seizure of things going wrong. And this green line is an, uh, a threshold that we, uh, that we decided to uh, use in this. Uh, in this example. But this, by the way, is an artifact. So artifacts <laughs> are also a uh, reality of life in, in EEG and in any electrical recording. So as a matter of fact, I thought this, uh, this particular patient uh, 
was a better example even than the one that uh, uh, the adult patient that I showed you in the previous slide. Now you have to realize, and that's a very port important realization, that when you do these uh, linear approximations, uh, you may miss all the nonlinear ones. And this is actually a uh, figure uh, of the textbook. This is uh, figure 17.2. And um, this shows you three waveforms. An uh, kind of noisy deterministic one. This is a nonlinear one. And this is pure noise. If you just looked at them, you could say, well, difference is not that great. It, it, it all looks. Uh, it looks like three messy signals. Right? If I look at the uh, correlation, which is a linear method, you can see that actually this uh, 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 signal shows an autocorrelation. And if I plot subsequent points against each other, you can see that indeed they also reflect an, uh, an, uh, a correlation uh, uh, over, uh, over time. In the real noise case, that's not at all true, because in the real noise, my autocorrelation is just 1 at 0 lag, and very close to 0 otherwise. See, And if I plot subsequent points against each other, you see I just get a uh, cloud. Uh, there is re really no relationship. Now the interesting thing, and that's the whole point of this figure, is here where you have a nonlinear relationship. If you do a cross-correlation, it tells you there is no relationship. See? It's exactly the same thing as that you find for noise. But if you plot subsequent points against each other, then you can see, well, there really is a relationship. As a matter of fact, there is a very strong relationship. The only thing is, a relationship is nonlinear. It's a parabola. And this is the kind of the point that if you have nonlinear relationships, these methods fail. They show you nothing. For that reason, uh, of course, people started to look into these uh, uh, nonlinear uh, nonlinear methods. And again, um, if you look at a number of uh, uh, a number of signals, uh, you can clearly see that this is a uh, periodic signal. But this, these are all kind of messy signals that could be almost anything. And for that reason, uh, it can be uh, pretty useful to uh, plot subsequent points uh, uh, against each other. In this case, of course, you get an, uh, a nice elliptic shape, uh, depending on the, uh, on the x and the y-axis. Uh, you, you can also make a circle out of that, of course. Um, here, in this case, you have noise. So you have basically dots all over the place. But here, again, we have our friend the logistic equation, the parabola. Here you have a Henon map, very nice uh, structure. And this actually is also a Henon map. You know how these two are different? This one starts at an initial condition. And this one starts at an initial condition plus, I forgot the exact number, I think it was uh, 0.0001. So almost the same initial condition, but not exactly. And you see they look very similar. If you embed them, they're both showing you the same structure. The interesting thing is this. When you subtract the two, you get this, which is kind of showing you why there is a horizon where you can predict. Because initially, the difference is not much. Initially, the first point of difference is 0 0.0001. Then the next point is a little bit more different. The next point is a little bit more different. But once we are here, the difference is enormous. And so here you can see why you are going to easily fail to predict in a nonlinear system. Because in a nonlinear system, little changes, eh, butterfly effect it's called, uh, little changes in the initial condition can actually cause a really huge uh, effect. In these, uh, in these chaotic systems. And so you can predict over a very small, uh, up, up to a very small horizon, and then after that, it's, it's done. So the question is a little bit in, 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 in seizures and in our brain situation. Uh, 
are we dealing with a strong nonlinearity like this, then we might have a shot at uh, predicting it, uh, providing that the horizon is, uh, is reasonably practically uh, usable. For that reason, uh, 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 yeah, you start to, uh, to do some what we call embedding of the EEG. And here you see some seizure activity. And here you can see that when you, uh, uh, when you uh, make a certain delay and you plot uh, uh, the point with the delay versus the first point, so this point versus that point, and you move over your waveform, you get this embedded uh, structure. And this structure tells you something about the uh, ongoing process, about the underlying process. And so you would like to characterize this uh, structure. And there are a couple of ways of doing that. First of all, there are um, two ways to capture where the points are. So in this case, you could say, well, in this uh, particular uh, example, I have a number of points. So here is, uh, uh, it's, it's drawn as a line, but it's really a number of uh, particular points. So where are these points? How are they distributed over uh, space? And that gives rise to uh, a dimension characteristic. The capacity dimension, correlation dimension are two flavors of uh, a dimension metric. And the other thing is you can try to uh, uh, describe the flow in this, uh, in this space, uh, in this spatial uh, uh, um, structure. And one of them is the Lyapunov exponent. And the other one, for instance, is uh, the Kolmogorov entropy. skip this one, and we're going to go to uh, the first flavor of dimension. So that's capacity dimension. It's not used very often because it's, uh, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's computationally quite intense to uh, use it. But I'll give you an example. If you have, um, uh, this is the equation for this uh, capacity dimension. And let's say that in this case, we set the value epsilon of the box uh, uh, to one tenth. That means that if I have a dimension here, uh, uh, one dimension from zero to one, and I put uh, one tenth here, I will get 10 boxes, isn't it? And if I then apply that to this equation, I basically, it will tell me that the line has a dimension of one. See? If I have an, uh, an area and I have one tenth, you can see that I will get 100 of these boxes, isn't it? Because now uh, the box is not a piece of a line, but it's really a two-dimensional little box. And basically, uh, in this case, I will have 100 of these boxes. And if I fill that out, my dimension is two. And of course, I didn't show that. But if in a cube, if I did the whole thing, I would get a 1,000 of these. And then my dimension would become three. So that is capacity dimension. It's basically a box counting algorithm. You just count the number of boxes where you find points. And if you find a point in every box, it means that, OK, I have a dimension of 1. Or in this case, if I find 1, OK, I have a dimension of 2. The interesting thing here is, and that's the reason I give this example, is that suppose that you find only um, um, points in a number of boxes then the dimension is not going to be entirely 2. It's going to be between 1 and 2. So with these type of dimensions, we are used to think of dimensions as integers. These type of dimensions can actually be non-integer. So uh, you can have a capacity dimension of 2.1. That means that's a cube where not every box of the cube is visited by the trajectory. That's basically what that means. Correlation dimension is another flavor of dimension. And uh, that looks at uh, the number of pairs. You just randomly pick some, uh, uh, some pairs. And you can see that uh, if, you, uh, if you have an uh, approximately one dimensional uh, uh, process, and you take a little uh, radius around uh, a point, and you count number of pairs, you will see that the number of pairs that you count is going to be relative and proportional to the radius. 
Whereas if your points are distributed over uh, uh, a two-dimensional space, oops. I have no idea what. Uh, yeah, if I uh, so I don't know what exactly happened. If uh, you have uh, your points across a two-dimensional space and you allow the same uh, radius, you will see that the number of pairs is now related to r squared. So the index here, uh, the exponent here, gives you an idea about uh, what uh, what the uh, dimensionality is. Now let's go to uh, one of the, uh, uh, the trajectory uh, uh, ideas, and one of them is the uh, Lyapunov exponent. In this case, you take in the trajectory, you just pick a piece of trajectory, and uh, let's say that we pick this piece of the trajectory, and then we are looking at the close by trajectory in the same, uh, uh, yeah, basically in the same embedded uh, uh, signal. And now we start to uh, look at uh, uh, the evolution of that trajectory, and we just see, okay, is there divergence here? And if it diverges beyond a certain line, that's just a uh, heuristic way of, uh, of computing this thing, you just rescale it and you look again. So every time you look basically and that's the underlying thought, is that if you have two trajectories, do they stay close by, or do they diverge, or do they converge? And clearly, if you have a chaotic system, they diverge. And they, uh, basically, if you, uh, if you make a little mistake in your initial condition here, you're going to blow up uh, the difference. And in a way, uh, the Kolmogorov entropy is doing the same thing. Um, it's just looking. Uh, it's just looking at the trajectories. Um, Kolmogorov entropy just uh, takes a certain time, and then it looks at the uh, amount of separation that is being obtained between two uh, uh, two trajectories uh, over time. So you just pick two points, and you see how they evolve. So here you have uh, the embedded uh, series. And if this is uh, reflecting a certain state, you can say that this is an attractor, a chaotic attractor in this case. And then we can characterize that uh, attractor in different ways, by indicating a dimension or by indicating how the trajectories uh, diverge. And we apply that to uh, the same uh, uh, signal that, uh, that I showed you. Uh, uh, we looked at the power. But we actually also looked at the Kolmogorov entropy, and we also looked at the uh, correlation uh, dimension. And we estimated that uh, uh, straightforward, but also with a maximum likelihood. Uh, and we had Kolmogorov entropy normalized per second and per cycle. Uh, so they are, again, normalized in different ways, but it's the same thing. Here's, again, an artifact. Here's where the seizure is, where the horizontal line is. And you can indeed see that uh, uh, the uh, the entropy here is kind of clearly going down roughly 20, 25 minutes before the seizure really starts. And after the seizure uh, basically stops, it uh, gets back to the, uh, the, the baseline. Kolmogorov entropy does that. Uh, correlation dimension does that too, but uh, not so clear. You can see there is the same trend, but it's not as clear as in the Kolmogorov entropy. And in this case, you can see that uh, power basically did the same thing. So in this case, uh, um, obviously, um, you would say, well, go with the power, because that's the simplest way of, uh, uh, of looking, at, uh, looking at the uh, evolution of your, uh, of your signal. Now, this was one case we, uh, we looked at, uh, in this case we looked at, f or in this study we looked at five uh, cases, and it was very uh, remarkable that uh, um, the power was doing uh, quite well uh, along a number of uh, patients. Uh, the uh, Kolmogorov entropy was basically working in, uh, in two patients. 
So we could not really come to the conclusion that there was a generic way of, uh, of, of predicting uh, these seizures, although in, uh, uh, in three of the five uh, patients uh, we, uh, we, had, uh, we had basically uh, uh, some, limited, uh, some limited success. It makes, uh, it makes basically what uh, uh, the statement of predicting of the future is difficult, uh, absolutely true. Uh, this is uh, indicating uh, uh, a lot of work that was done in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Uh, and you can clearly see that uh, uh, there is a uh, wide variety of uh, uh, horizons that were claimed. Uh, we claimed an uh, horizon up to uh, half an hour in some patients. But as you could see, the, that, that first uh, paper from Brian Litt, uh, he basically indicated a horizon of seven hours, so more than an hour. And uh, you can see that uh, there are horizons uh, uh, more or less all over the place. And this probably reflects also the, the, the variability of, uh, of this whole uh, uh, epilepsy as a disease because as I said there are already clinically there are 40 to 50 types of uh, seizures and once you have looked at a lot of seizures you sometimes think that there are as many types uh, of epilepsy as there are patients uh, because they basically uh, all look a little bit different. So where is this going to uh, Go. This is the part that I'm going to skip. This is uh, the part that I would like to discuss, which is that uh, you just saw, and that is what most people did, uh, that we looked at a window around the seizure, like an hour before and an hour after. The reason you do that is uh, because it's computationally it's pretty intense. But now, we are about a decade uh, later, the computational power has increased a lot, and... Uh, you can also use parallel computers. So what people started to do, that is instead of looking at um, windows of an hour or two hours, they started to look at 24-7 uh, records. And here you see an, uh, an, an analysis we did over 24 hours. So this is hours. <laughs> and one interesting thing you immediately see, this is the Kolmogorov entropy again, is that this thing is not only detecting my seizures, as you can see. But it is also a little bit sensitive to the sleep state, because here is where the patient falls asleep. So that means that uh, um, it may be a very sensitive detector, but it's not a very specific detector. It detects more than just seizures. And in this case, uh, um, actually, the seizure that it detects is, uh, is not useful for prediction, because uh, you can see that if you uh, look at the detail around one of the events that uh, yeah, the detection is there, but uh, there is really not a uh, warning in this particular patient. In another patient, uh, uh, that is again 24 hours, we did not see this dependence on sleep state uh, that much. And that was also due to the fact that this patient was not having normal uh, a sleep cycle, uh, maybe. Uh, and if we looked at, uh, at this one uh, in more detail, we could uh, in all cases see that, yeah, there was a downward going slope when leading to an event, and then it was kind of uh, uh, changing again. But as you can see, there is so much fluctuation going on here that uh, you have to basically step back a little bit and say, well, listen, this may, this may uh, not be as good an, uh, uh, way of uh, predicting uh, seizures as we initially thought it was when we were looking at smaller windows. So the field is uh, um, its a bit disappointing maybe, but uh, people spend a lot of time doing this, but the field is basically stepping back a little bit and saying, well, we really have to look at uh, larger uh, epochs, not looking at just one hour around the seizure, but really 24-7. And we have to make sure that our prediction and detection mechanisms uh, work better than random detectors uh, over such, uh, such a time period. And that's where the field currently is uh, working. There are also alternatives. Uh, there is uh, certainly uh, a uh, uh, discussion that uh, 
people uh, with epilepsy sometimes have dogs that seem to behave uh, differently or seem to pick up something. And uh, the question is what? There have been a, a, a number of, uh, um, there have been a number of uh, um, uh, papers on that, uh, but it's not really clear that uh, A, if there is really uh, a uh, warning from, uh, from the dog, and B, if there is, it's really not clear whether it is an olfactory one or whether it picks up behavior or whether it's visual or, or, or any other sensory. Uh, so there hasn't been a real systematic uh, uh, behavior. This, by the way, is not a seizure dog. This is my dog. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, right now there is also a, a lot of discussion about uh, the application of uh, medical marijuana. Um, for instance, uh, right now uh, there is a uh, large trial going on with uh, CBD, which is one of the uh, active components in, uh, in, uh, in the marijuana plant. So that's uh, another option that people are looking into. Although, again, just as with the dogs, there is really not a good model or a good underlying uh, theory why this uh, should work. And, uh, and of course, if you don't know what you are doing, then it's going to be difficult to predict how well it's going to work or how it's going to interact with other, uh, with other ways of um, uh, treating the disease. And of course, as a last one, it's never a good idea to combine things uh, uh, when you don't know what you're doing. And that's, I think, where we will stop. <laughs>